Hello, today's video we have the following content. Wang Yibo rectifies the name of Xiaoxianro, the financial secret war behind the storm chaser and the history of China's banking industry. To be honest, I guessed Yu Shaqing in the storm chaser at a glance, which alluded to the famous Shanghai celebrity at that time, Yu Kaiaking. His identity in the play is that he is the principal of the Jiangsu and Zhejiang Chamber of Commerce, and the word Allah he says undoubtedly betrays him. He is not the principal of the Jiangsu and Zhejiang Chamber of Commerce. He should be the principal of the Ningbo Chamber of Commerce, or the Siming Chamber of Commerce. Full stop. In fact, he was elected president of the Shanghai General Chamber of Commerce in 1924 and was a well-known Shanghai beach boss. The Shanghai Stock Exchange, the main battlefield for launching financial wars in the play, was also organized by him in 1918. This is a drama that I have rarely followed in recent years. The one I was following before was Ming Dynasty 1566 and the other was the spy drama Rebel, starring Zhu Yilin and Tong Yao. Like the storm chaser, Wang Yang is the main actor. In the former, Wang Yang played the role of Chen Makwan, who was arrogant and fierce in the military, but was eventually forced to commit treason. In the latter, Wang Yang played the role of an executive in the central bank with empty ambitions, but was ultimately defeated by corruption, internal strife, and war. Shen Chunan. Of course, what surprised me the most was the other male protagonist, Wang Yibo. I wasn't familiar with Wang Yibo before. Judging from the information, he should have debuted around the same time as Teeth Boys. To be honest, because of the outstanding performance of some people, I have never had a good impression of Xiaoxi and Rao and Fanquin. However, Wang Yibo's performance in this drama changed my impression of this group. But to be honest, the kid he plays who sneaks into Shanghai from rural Zhangzi province, except for the shabby suit he wears, doesn't have the temperament of a farm boy at all. This is a bit messed up. Relatively speaking, his fiancée Niu Chun Niao looked like a village girl, but her acting was a bit too hard, which seemed a bit too much. But no matter what, because of Shanghai and because of his love for finance, a young man with no power and no academic qualifications, and was he even considered to have a problematic background due to the particularity of the current situation in Shaanxi at that time, a young man with passionate ambitions who tried to build a real central bank, the financial savior who achieved financial unification, and another predator who controlled the financial lifeline of Shanghai, colluded with officials, safeguarded his own interests at every turn, and stood on the opposite side of the central bank, and was thus tied together by fate. To be honest, I admire Shen Tunan's financial pursuits. I once wrote Revitalizing, A Century of Chinese Private Finance and I know that for a long time, financial activities were spontaneous actions from the bottom up, and even the right to mint money was once not in the hands of the state. For example, China's first banknote, Jirozi, appeared in Chengdu, Sichuan. It was issued by merchants who felt that it was too inconvenient to trade with iron money, so they used the merchant's own credibility as a guarantee. Later, the emergence of bank accounts and banks made the private sector the main participants in financial activities. During the Jiangxi incident in the late Qing dynasty, the Shanxi bank account became the Ministry of Finance when the Qing court fled westward because of its convenient exchange. It was not until 1905, with the approval of the Finance Department, that the Qing government established the Household Bank in Beijing. This was the earliest officially established national bank in my country. As a quasi-central bank, the Bank of Accounts was established with the responsibility and obligation to maintain financial stability. However, as the account department became a branch in the future institutional reform, the account department bank was renamed Daking Bank. Established shortly after the Bank of Qing Dynasty, there was the Bank of Communications established in Beijing in 1908 by the Ministry of Posts and Communications, with the purpose of revitalizing the four political undertakings of wool, road, telecommunications and postal services. After the revolution of 1911, the Quinn Bank was reorganized into the Bank of China. This is why today's Bank of China and Bank of Communications call themselves century-old banks. In a sense, the emergence of the Bank of China and the Bank of Communications can, on the one hand, counter the unscrupulous plunder of foreign capital and establish a financial defense line for the country. On the other hand, it can also deal with the turbulence of the financial currency system in the obscure era. Although Shanghai banks, Hu Shang Pawn Shops, and Ningbo banks have played a major role in promoting the development of China's financial industry, some banks and bank banks have insufficient integrity, are unjust for profit, or have very few reserves due to the turmoil. A lot of money was issued, resulting in void money with less money and more money. In the end, 
all kinds of bank notes, bank notes, and bank notes were mixed in circulation or occupied their own place, and the financial order was very chaotic. While emerging banks have brought a new atmosphere, they have also caused a lot of risks and crises due to their fragmented approach. For the sake of national stability, a national bank must be established and central bank bank notes must be issued uniformly. However, compared with the central bank established in 1923, the Bank of China and the Bank of Communications are jointly run by the government and businessmen due to private equity participation. Therefore, for a long time, it has been relatively independent and can resist the unreasonable demands of the government at any time. This is why Shen Tunin, who returned from studying in Germany, faced huge pressure, even being assassinated and targeted, to launch financial wars to strengthen the central bank by annexing banks such as Tongchang and Xingxia to one's own strength. In order to show his passion, the big boss behind these banks, Yu Shaiking, inevitably became a villain. In the play, the big guys headed by Yu Shaiking colluded to make the stock exchange a living newspaper drama through going long or short, where countless people laughed or cried. For example, Wei Rulei's landlord Aunt Zhou lost a year's worth of food in one day. What makes people smile is that Wei Rulei, who was imprisoned for some reason, after getting involved with the poor brothers, followed the good advice and never traded in stocks again. In addition, in order to protect their own interests, the bosses did not hesitate to create all kinds of embarrassments for Shen Tunin, and even created confrontational situations on major matters related to the fundamental interests of the country, such as the recovery of tariff custody rights that they led. These plots, undoubtedly, the audience's hatred for these big guys was filled, and the ugly face of capitalism overflowed on the screen. If Shen Tunin represents the country, then Yu Shaiking represents the people. Storm Chaser uses the confrontation between the people and the state to increase the drama of the story, which is not a bad idea. What Shen Tunin didn't expect was that he loved this country, but the state power he served did not belong to the people. He regarded the three people's principles as his belief in life. He never expected that the central bank for which he paid would eventually become a tool for the four major families hated by Chiang Kai-shek to absorb private wealth and serve to launch civil war and maintain centralized rule. Shen Tunin thought that he was working to make the country rich and powerful, but in the end, he was working for the tiger. The historical reality is exactly the opposite of what is shown in the play. In the process of the advancement of the country and the retreat of the people in the financial industry, it was the Shen Tunin who held the butcher's knife high, while the Yu Shaiking became the lambs to be slaughtered. In addition to establishing the central bank, the four major families have also set their sights on the Bank of China and the Bank of Communications. First, they let their power penetrate into the two banks by mixing sand. For example, in 1927, when Chiang Kai-shek established a military dictatorship in Nanjing, he ordered the general management office of the Bank of China to be moved from Beijing to Shanghai and forcibly invested 5 million yuan in official shares. In 1928, the general management office of the Bank of Communications was also ordered to move to Shanghai and was forced to add 20% of its official shares, but only half, 1 million yuan, was actually paid. In 1935, taking advantage of the national financial crisis, the government issued 100 million yuan in financial bonds to serve as funds for the central government, the China Banking Corporation, and the Communications Bank. As a result, Bank of China's official shares increased to 20 million yuan, and since then it has been evenly divided between the government and businessmen. The official shares of Bank of Communications have also reached 11 million, accounting for 55% of the total capital. In today's terms, it is government-controlled. Su Simo's brother-in-law, the famous Chinese banker Zhang Jiao, made such a big move when he was just starting out, as deputy manager of the Shanghai branch of the Bank of China. He and his boss at the time, Song Hansang, joined forces to resist the BIN government's suspension order. In order to avoid being dismissed or arrested by the government, which would lead to failure in their resistance to the suspension of redemption, Song Hansang adopted self-litigation to delay government decrees. This is also because according to the law, the Beijing authorities cannot arrest the current manager or deputy manager while the lawsuit is pending. In a sense, the efforts of Song, Zhang and others stemmed from the dreams and ambitions of their generation, which was to establish a financial market that does not rely on the government based on modern consciousness, enterprising spirit and nationalist enthusiasm, and establishing an indispensable institutional foundation for conducting financial transactions and executing financial contracts will ultimately promote commercial modernization and even the social transformation of modern China. Zhang Jiao's contemporary mirror, 
In the game between capital and power, capital always loses, Yin Ziyadilin, China Europe Business Review, December 15, 2022. However, they survived the pressure from Biyang, but they did not survive the pressure of the Big Four. The Black Hand of the Family. In March 1935, Chiang Kai-shek forcibly transferred Zhang Jiao from the Bank of China and appointed Zhang as the nominal vice president of the central bank. Except for once again serving as the president of the central bank after the victory of the anti-Japanese war, Zhang Jiao had no stage to perform in the banking industry. In the play, Mr. Song, whom Shun Tunin often reports to and whose voice is often heard but never seen, should be Song Zhuan. In March 1935, Song Zhuan became chairman of the Bank of China and actively participated in currency reform, which also led to the rapid expansion of bureaucratic monopoly capital. In this year, with the establishment of the four banks and two bureaus, the Central Bank, Bank of China, Bank of Communications, Farmers Bank of China, Central Trust Bureau and Postal Savings and Remittance Bureau, the bureaucratic capital of the four major families completed their control of finance exclusive. I feel sorry for Shen Tuna back then. Although he contributed his efforts to building the country's financial order with all his skills, it was a pity that he was entrusted to someone else at the beginning. He doesn't seem to understand that a country's financial vitality is actually composed of both the private sector and the state. We not only need to give full play to the free and convenient characteristics of private finance in order to promote the development of small and medium-sized enterprises and the development of the national economy, but we also need to strengthen national supervision of finance so that private finance can operate under the sun. In a sense, this is also the fundamental reason why China today has formed a financial system with the central bank as the leader, national specialized banks as the main body, and a variety of financial institutions coexisting and working in division of labor. Today's central bank, the People's Bank of China, no longer competes with the people for profit as it did in the past, but has become a policy bank. Under the overall management of the central bank, many financial institutions, including commercial joint stock banks and private banks, can give full play to their ingenuity and contribute to the development of China's economy. It can be said that Shen Tunin was born at the wrong time. What he did actually hurt many private financial people. Jiang Su and Jiu on Capital, represented by Yu Shikin in the play and Yu Kayakin outside the play, have also been pushed against themselves. Having said that, Behind the chaos of random banknotes and frequent financial crises, there are actually shadows of the random actions of big bosses such as Yu Kaiaking. In fact, this famous Shanghainese who was born in the barren land of Zhenhei, Ningbo, and whose name was used to name roads in Shanghai, today's Tibet Middle Road is Yu Kaiaking Road, also did many detestable things. For example, after the outbreak of the anti-Japanese war, he took advantage of the opportunity of Sino-Foreign Cooperation and running a relief agency and served as the president of the Shanghai Refugee Relief Association. In the name of relieving refugees, he transported rice from Saigon to Shanghai tax-free, making a huge fortune from the national crisis, but he was heavily punished for this. Criticism, even stigmatization as in Storm Chaser, is still inconsistent with historical dialectics. In my book Ningbo Gang, how the world's number one merchant gang stirred up modern China, I gave a detailed description of Yu Kaiaking. Here, he led his short-term friends to fight against the pressure of the concession through strikes, and used popular sentiment to overwhelm foreign sentiment, he organized business groups to protect the interests of the Chinese, and prepared the Nanyang Entrepreneurship Association to promote industry. More importantly, he personally participated in the process of industrial salvation, prepared the establishment of Siming Bank, and founded the Ningxia a merchant shipping company in order to break the monopoly of the Shanghai Ningbo route by British shipping companies such as Swire Pacific. Among them, Sanvi Ferry Terminal Company, Limited is his most generous enterprise. Despite this or that shortcoming, in the face of a turning point in history, he wisely chose revolution and made a clean break with the past. In him, it can be seen that he has a profit-seeking side of a traditional businessman, but he also has a righteous side of Ningbo people. At the same time, as a Ningbo native who grew up in the west wind and beautiful rain and faced the ocean since childhood, he is pioneering and enterprising and is good at dealing with the west. In a sense, the reason why I regard the Ningbo gang, including Yu Kayaking, as the best business gang in the world is that they are in a period of great change that has not happened in China for a thousand years and have promoted China's modern transformation. In comparison, Shanxi merchants and Hu merchants are still traditional business gangs in the farming era. After they make money, 
They mostly spend their profits on buying houses and land for education, just like the large courtyards in Jin's Hong. Therefore, once the times change, it will be difficult for Shanxi and Hu's Hao merchants who are huddled in the compound to transform. It's not that they were unsuccessful, they simply didn't realize it. On the contrary, the Ningbo Gang, who has a good pen and good calculations, mostly invests profits in the expansion of large-scale production of industrial entities, pushing China to meet the difficulties of industrial civilization. Today, we laugh at Yu Shikin and others pursued a fame and fortune in the Storm Chaser, but we fail to see that in reality, Yu Kayakin invests more money in industry. Until the founding of New China, countless Ningbo gangs were still struggling on the front line of building the motherland. Among the rising figures of Hong Kong, we can also see many people from Ningbo. Like Dong Hei Oian and Bei Yu Gang. Therefore, in 1984, Dan Gong issued an important instruction, we must mobilize the Ningbo Gang from all over the world to build Ningbo. This is also the origin of today's Ningbo Gang, Help Ningbo. It is precisely because of the continuous adventurous innovation and service of Ningbo people that Ningbo has developed rapidly. To this day, a group of groups named after new Ningbo merchants have been born. The entities or brands they have created include Ningbo Bank, Bull, Fothile, Pisabird, Oaks, Younger, Delhi, Shachin, Shenzhou, G Krypton, Boyang, Bifa, Leggy, Haitian, Helen, are all the responsible for appearance and responsible for strength of this country. A few days ago, at the foot of Heo Bay Ocean Mountain in Shenhe, the outlet of the Yuangjian River in Ningbo, I met President Fan of the Shenhe Middle School Alumni Association, Director Wang Wei of the Ningbo Bang Museum who came from Jilong Lake, and Ma Jianhui, a well-known local media person teacher, we had an interesting conversation on the topic of Ningbo Gang. Yu Kayaking walked out from Shenhe. In recent years, there have been countless outstanding students who have graduated from Shenhe Middle School. President Fan mentioned that the first generation of Ningbo gangs like Yu Kayaking have benefited from education and will definitely pass on the concept of advocating culture and education to the second and third generations. This is also an important reason why education in Shenhe and even Ningbo as a whole continues to flourish. For director Wang Wei, the Ningbo Gang is undoubtedly the city's greatest wealth. The construction of the Ningbo Gang Museum is also to let everyone know the Ningbo Gang and inherit the spirit of the Ningbo Gang. Even though there is the stigma of the storm chaser, fortunately there is still a museum to rectify the name of the Ningbo Gang. In my opinion, compared to Shanxi merchants and Hu's Hao merchants, Ningbo Gangs were in the midst of a great transformation of modernization. During this period, due to the invasion by Western powers, China's national sentiment had been very intense. In addition, the rules of the game brought about by the great changes have been destroyed or diluted, which has also led to the Ningbo Gang inevitably being infected with some bad habits. Sometimes in order to succeed, just like Yu Shikin in the Storm Chaser, it is inevitable to walk in gray or even black areas. Full stop. At the same time, when Chiang Kai-shek moved towards dictatorship step by step, the shadow of the Jiangsu Zhejiang Consortium with the Ningbo Gang as an important force was always behind it. It has to be said that it is this weakness in life and the stain of history that made the Ningbo Gang a relatively embarrassing existence in the mainstream ideology after the founding of New China. It was blocked intentionally or unintentionally, and it was not like Shanxi merchants and Hu's Hao merchants, they became objects of free speech. Therefore, we need to re-understand the Ningbo Gang. I also feel that although New Yuan Chang has become a very fashionable term today, it cannot fully represent the Ningbo Gang. The Ningbo Gang in history was dominated by the Ningbo Business Gang, but its influence on modern China was multi-level and in all aspects, including the political field, the educational field, and the scientific and technological field. Therefore, you cannot simply regard Ningbo as a gang. The Ningbo Merchant Gang is regarded as the same as the Ningbo Merchant Gang, and the new Ningbo Merchant Gang cannot be directly equated with the Ningbo Merchant Gang. Ningbo Gang is a large-scale concept. In my summary, it is a collection of all Ningbo people who have a pioneering and innovative spirit, have unchanging feelings about their family and country, and are committed to the peaceful development of the country and the world. Finally, as an Anhui person, people often question why you, an Anhui person, write about Ningbo Gang instead of Wei merchants. But I feel that who's how merchants are the wealth of Chinese history, and so are the Ningbo Gang. It can be seen from the storm chasers that the Ningbo Gang has influenced China's modern history. It not only belongs to Ningbo, but also to China and the world. Over the years, research on the Ningbo Gang has, for some reason, been on the one hand silent. On the other hand, 
it has been regarded as a regional business gang. However, the lack of a clear voice has mostly been attributed to Ningbo locals researched. Therefore, in the future, I hope that under the call of Ningbo Gang, help Ningbo and Ningbo Gang, help China, Ningbo Gang will be taken more and more seriously, and research will also move from localization to globalization. The Ningbo Gang in the new era, like the newly promoted merchants in the new Hu's Hao merchants, must all be chasers of the wind. Next news. Wang Yibo endorses the Olympic qualifying competition, showing youthful vitality. Colin Shanghai, China, Yibo, a star in the entertainment industry, recently became the promotion ambassador for the Beijing Winter Olympics Olympic qualifying tournament. He wore a green outdoor sports brand rat jacket, showing his youthful atmosphere and strength. As a publicity ambassador for the Shanghai Olympic qualification tournament, Yibo uses practical actions to support niche sports, including skateboarding, rock climbing, break dancing and freestyle BMX competitions. The promotion of these projects allows more people to understand the charm and challenge of these sports. Yibo's success lies not only in his charm and popularity, but also in his love and focus on sports. His athletic abilities are comparable to those of professional athletes, and coupled with his popularity, he has become a promotional ambassador for these niche sports, attracting a large number of fans to participate in these sports. Yibo's charm is not only reflected in his athletic talent, but also in his dedication to his career and his care for society. He worked on an exploratory documentary that was hailed as the best in the world. And that green jacket was made by Rat, his favorite outdoor sports brand, and complemented his personality perfectly. Today, Yibo has become the spokesperson of the niche movement, and his works and image are deeply rooted in the hearts of the people. His influence is not limited to the entertainment industry, but also lies in his love and support for sports. His success story tells us that as long as we have dreams and work hard, we will be able to realize our dreams. Thank you for watching the video. If this is your first time watching a video, please subscribe to the channel, like and leave your comments to help us develop your channel.